In this episode of Quit Builds, we explore how much power is in your shower. When I became the first person to charge a smartphone using rain gutters, people asked in the comments how much energy could be harnessed from their shower. But part of it depends on how often we shower, which my son avoids since he hates getting his sister's hair out of the tub. And just like the rain gutter experiment, the first thing we need to know is flow rate, or how much water comes out per unit time. So I'm using a five gallon bucket and a clock, which after some simple division comes out to two gallons per minute, matching the specs listed on the shower head. But wait, two gallons per minute is the same as what we calculated for the rain gutter, and that only produced a couple of watts. To find out why, let's take a quick look at the math. The flow rate was only the first part of the equation. To get power, we had to multiply flow by the height of the tube, density of the water, and gravity, which equaled two watts. But what height would we use for our shower? If our water were coming from a water tower, we could use that height, but that's not the case where I live. In the video where we used water pressure to inflate a tire on my car, we found the city water pressure was between 80 to 83 PSI. But where do we put that in our equation? Well, in engineering school, the professors burned into our brains that density, gravity, and height make up pressure. So all we need to do is swap in our 80 PSI and we're good, right? Mm, sort of. Since metric makes everything easier, we want to convert PSI to something called pascals. Then anywhere we see a liter, we convert to cubic meters so the units come out okay. That allows us to replace all this junk on the left with the pressure in pascals, which when multiplied by the new flow rate, comes to 70 watts. Now when I started working on this video, I thought I would build the first ever self-powered light-up shower head, but as is often the case, I'm not the first person to think of something cool. Turns out they're popular enough you can just buy one for pretty cheap and ponder hydropower while having your own private disco party. I have my guesses about how this thing works, but to be sure, we've got to take it apart. I tried a gentle approach, but the hacksaw was the ticket inside. Now, there's got to be some sort of impeller in here somewhere. Ah, there it is. Now, where's my air nozzle? Oh, yeah! Of course, the best way to keep water out is to drown it in sealant. But hey, the lade don't care. Turns out the impeller has magnets inside that spin around coils of wire. Those are tied to a circuit board with color-changing LEDs. But fans of this channel know it only takes a fraction of a watt to light up a few LEDs. If we want to get serious about shower power, we're going to need something far bigger. Fortunately, I've got an old generator left over from the wind power videos that should do the trick. We never got more than 200 watts out of it, but that's way more than the 70 watts we need it for. To spin it, we're gonna use a Pelton wheel, which maximizes efficiency by sending the water back in the opposite direction. And here's how we demonstrate that. When I spray the wood, it's just bringing the water to a stop. But when I move over to the bowl, it's stopping the water and sending it back at me, which is double the change in momentum and that's why the pendulum is going higher with the bowl. But the last time we 3D printed one, we used my FDM style 3D printer, then spent a bunch of time trying to chemically treat the surfaces to make them smooth. But this time I've got a brand new resin 3D printer that does a way better job. Honestly, I'm a little nervous this perfect little turbine is gonna get destroyed by the jet of water, but I'm crossing my fingers and hoping for the best. Speaking of jets, we need a nozzle that can direct a single jet of water along the center of our turbine. To get the right size hole in the center, I dug up the old Bernoulli equation from fluid dynamics. It looks intimidating at first, until we cancel out all the parts we don't need. We're left with a much simpler equation that when rearranged, tells us the velocity of water coming out the shower head in meters per second. But what does that have to do with nozzle size? The flow rate through a nozzle, assuming frictionless laminar flow, equals the area times velocity. If we punch in the equation for area that uses diameter, then solve for D, we get 2.2 millimeters or 0.086 inches. 
but when I test the water flow, it comes out way lower than expected. Was the math wrong? Well, remember how we measured the pressure at the hose outside? That water source is probably four meters lower than the upstairs shower head, meaning the pressure should be about five PSI lower. And installing the same gauge in the shower verifies it. But watch what happens when we let the water flow through the shower head. The pressure drops again. Some of this could be the speed of the water near the gauge, but it's also losses due to friction since we don't truly have laminar flow in an infinite tank of water. At any rate, when we recalculate nozzle diameter based on this lower pressure, things come out much closer, giving us a nozzle closely matching the flow rate of the original shower head. Except this one could pressure wash your driveway. Now that we have a nozzle that simulates the shower head, we need a way to align everything in the shower. This is where CAD really helps get everything just how we want it before fabricating a single part. And this is yet another opportunity to take advantage of 3D printing. When we machine something, every detail takes additional time, but for the most part, when 3D printing, complexity is essentially free. So once the parts are done and we've run them through wash and cure stations, we're ready to mount everything to the wall. The generator looks complicated, but all it does is spin permanent magnets in a circle next to coils of wire. The electricity it makes will change dramatically with the speed of the generator, so the best way to make it usable is with something called a rectifier. In my second rain power video, I showed in slow motion that magnets passing a coil of wire make electricity go in both directions. But a rectifier works like an electric valve, making it flow in one direction. It's kind of like blowing up a balloon. We pinch it for each breath so the air only goes into the balloon, not out. Everything's set, so it's time to fire it up for the first time. But I was so excited, I completely missed what happened. Did you see it? Oh, it's spinning. Let's back things up. As soon as the generator spins up, the voltage pegs out the gauge way above what these electronics are rated for. The red flash of light is at least one of the three voltage converters burning up. And while it still partially charges my phone, eventually something more made an audible pop, cooling me in that something's very wrong. Yeah, I just had something exciting go on here. We got a... Uh, I heard a pop and the uh, one of the voltage regulators blew apart. There's a piece of it here and uh, I hooked up my voltmeter. No wonder. 65 volts, man. These uh, voltage converters are only designed to have like maximum 35 volts going into them. So. Uh, I had some concerns last night that this thing wasn't producing enough power to charge my phone, but it turns out it was just way overdoing it, and uh, this one got super hot up here, so uh, I need to figure out how to slow down the power on this thing, the way the shower is set up. Uh, I, I can only put a certain minimum flow rate through it, so I need to add some kind of a valve or something to slow this thing down because it is way overdriving the poor little electronics that I put in here. <laughs> we'll get it figured out though. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. I added a valve to control the water flow and found better voltage converters. But turns out partially opening the valve wouldn't produce much power and opening it all the way would send the voltage too high. That's when I remembered this generator has three phases and simply changing the wiring can have a dramatic effect on voltage. You may have noticed there were three wires coming from the generator, one for each phase. This example is a bit oversimplified, but bear with me. Let's represent each phase with a single coil of wire. In what's called a Y or star configuration, the phases connect at the center and wires connect to the end of each phase individually. But in what's known as the delta configuration, the phases sit like they're holding hands and the wires connect where they meet. But now let's compare how many coils of wire are between the wires going to our rectifier. In the delta configuration, there's only one coil between each set of wires, but in the Y configuration, there are two. So whatever voltage is in a single coil will be doubled in the Y configuration, and that's how our generator is wired. So switching it to delta might just solve our over-voltage problem by itself. Now honestly, I've never rewired a three-phase generator before, 
and really don't want to screw it up. So I'm making my son Grant do it instead. That way if it doesn't work, it can't be my fault, right? I found him a diagram for it. What more does he need? I mean, he probably did it right. Well, one way to find out. All right, let's open that valve. Ah. Wide open. It's definitely running slower. Wow, is it running slower. I hope it's not like shorting out or something. Let's change our... Whoa! Uh... I don't know about this. Something's not going right. Doing that whole charging more slowly thing. If it's charging at all, I mean, just look at this. It's trying. I mean, it's not even getting a amp. All right, shut this down. We get clogged or, I mean, oh, whoa, something mechanically is way harder to turn. You hear that? The bearing is squeaking. Oh, maybe the bearing is seized. Yeah. It kind of looks like we're spinning this inside of the bearing itself. The bearing, it, the bearing stopped rotating. <laughs> All right, I got the thing off there. It is locked up. I mean, I can wiggle it just a little bit, but this thing is not moving. So we were spinning that spindle inside the bushing of the, the middle of the bearing there just spinning inside of that so that was we, were, we weren't getting any benefit from having this ball bearing in there uh okay so i got to figure this out i don't know if we can free this thing up and and get it working again or if i have to completely replace it i i'm almost certain i don't have a bearing like this i might have the other cap left over from the other wind turbine i'm not sure well we'll get this straightened out and see what we got luckily i'm such a pack rat that I do still have the cap assembly from the first wind turbine tucked away, and its bearing is as good as new. The caps are slightly different, but the bearings are identical. So after a quick swap, we're back in business. Oh yeah. I don't wanna go any higher unless I can see the input voltage. There we go, I can see the input. Let's keep going. Oh, nice. All right, full throttle, 25 volts. We're not gonna burn anything up. Now, USB. Do it, come on, come on. Boy, it is really trying to get a full amp out of that thing. All right, so we are screwing around with five volts and 0.6. So what's that gonna be? Three watts? Come on, this thing, this should be putting out way more than this. Why are we struggling? I wonder if I've got the jet in the wrong spot on this thing. Uh, let's play with that. Our jet. We're gonna stick it in there. We're just going to hand orient this thing and see what we can't do with our numbers. First to verify. Oh yeah, dang, crazy. All right. Uh. I pointed the jet of water every which way I could think of, but never saw any significant increase in power coming out of the generator. I even tried holding up the hose in case the sharp bend at the end was having an effect. Nah, it doesn't seem to be making much difference at all. But then I remembered this newer voltage converter allows yep, us to limit the current, volts. which should even out the surging of the generator for more consistent uh, charging. Oh, right. We're going to limit our current. A little overcurrent light coming on, I think. So we're limiting it with constant current. We are charging the phone. 
as the percentage is going up. So it is possible to charge your phone with your shower. We're not just putting voltage into it, we're actually charging the dang thing. Okay, it's working, but that Pelton, I, I'm thinking it's gotta be the Pelton wheel. So we know that changing the design or geometry of the Pelton wheel can make a big difference. So easy thing to try, print out a couple of different ones and we'll see what we get. But before we get to that, I know many of you watch this channel because you want to understand the science behind the madness. Well, if you want to take that to the next level, check out Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Now, the cool thing about Brilliant is you get to learn interactively, almost like you're doing real world experiments on your own. Access the content through their website or app, then choose any topic that interests you. Since this video is about water power, I went straight to the lessons on flow under the scientific thinking course. But even though I have a solid background in fluids, I was surprised how many of their examples I'd never considered before. Another skill I want to develop for future videos is computer science. I've got a textbook on the subject, but honestly, it's a lot more fun using Brilliant's hands-on examples. And of course, the more fun it is, the more likely I am to keep doing it, which maximizes results. Believe me, whether you're a complete beginner or seeking advanced math, Brilliant's got something to offer you. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org forward slash quint builds and the first 200 of you will get a 20% discount off a premium membership. I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video and thank you for considering Brilliant because by supporting them, you're supporting me. I wouldn't tell you about them unless I believed it was worth your time. So please do check them out. Now many people will say there's no point to this because the water pressure is generated by a pump somewhere which consumes power in the first place but that's not necessarily the case. The water at my house is gravity fed from two 20 million gallon reservoirs on a hill. And though those reservoirs are filled by a pump, the largest city in my state, just 10 miles away, is supplied entirely by gravity fed pipelines. In fact, there's so much excess energy, a local company installed turbines in the water mains to harness it. Now, I'm not saying generating power from a shower head is practical, but it is an opportunity for better understanding involving learning and doing. But hey, we still didn't answer the question of whether the two other Pelton turbines did any good. And the answer is no. In fact, if anything, they made it a little worse. So we still have the mystery of where all of our extra power is getting lost. But what do you think? Are we losing it in the generator, in the nozzle, in the hose, in the electronics? Or did I mess up the math and we're actually getting exactly what we're supposed to get? My guess, based on the velocity of the jet, is that we're spinning the generator way faster than it was designed for, which is evidenced by the occasional 500 peak hertz that we see on the oscilloscope. But tell me in the comments what you think I should try next, and if there's enough interest, we'll do a follow-up video and maximize the power from our shower. But that's all for now. I'm Quint with another one of my builds. Thanks for watching.